So in most, one of the lessons I think is, is avoid it as much as you can um, or go all the way. Um, and I think Be Another Lab is a great example of that. Um, in uh, the, the technology that they've developed called the Machine to Be Another, which is very cheap technology. You can actually go to their website and find out how you can create your own experiments with it. Uh, it allows you to switch bodies, naked or clothed, uh, and literally see yourself through someone else's eyes. Um, it's probably one of the best examples of going all the way in VR so far. Um, I'm just sure. How many of you have seen this video come across your Facebook timeline at some point? Um, to give you a short The Machine to be clip. Another combines neuroscience. Oops. The Machine to be Another combines neuroscience protocols with art performances to trick the brain's perception of one's own body. Instead of seeing themselves in the body of a digital avatar, like in most of the neuroscience studies, the machine allows users to see themselves in the body of a real person. The protocol of interaction combines visual, audio, physical and motor stimuli. The system is coded in Arduino, Pure Data and Open Frameworks and uses a low-budget hardware composed by video games head-mounted displays, first-person stereo cameras, Arduino and servo engines. During art residencies, exhibitions, performances and academic congresses of anthropology and embodied interaction, we developed several applications of the machine to be another addressing issues like mutual respect, gender identity, generational conflicts, immigration and physical disability bias, body extension and neuro rehabilitation. More than an art installation, the machine to be another is a creative commons initiative that can be replicated by anyone interested in understanding the world through the eyes of the other and therefore interested in understanding themselves. So if you feel like trying that, you can go to their website and actually uh, get the how-to uh, to get two DK2s, two Oculus Rift uh, devices, two laptops, and you can do it together with your best friend, your mother, someone. I did it with my mother, with clothes. Um, another exciting trend in both VR and non-VR projects is combining it with biometric technology. Um, at IFA, we love experiences um, like that, but we especially like the ones where technology like that is not just used um, to create an interface, uh, but is used in combination with bringing people, uh, with people bringing their own personal experiences to the piece. Um, and a good example of that is the Emotional Arcade. This is another project that we commissioned um, where we, where the artist invited uh, the audience to feel something as hard as they can. Uh, and to engage in different uh, little competitions with each other, trying to feel something as hard as they can, uh, using uh, um, EEG scanners and facial recognition software and all sorts of things. And I'll show you a little clip. Emotion was chill, and I didn't think of anything. I thought of nothing. Cool sunsets, sunrises. The first time I was down here, when we were at the beach, I got like tons of pictures and stuff. I was thinking about Benny's chewing crackers. My target emotion was lust, and I was thinking of passion and desire. My targeted emotion was rage. I, I play a lot of video games and I, I get mad at that a lot. My emotion was bliss and I got there by looking at my nephew competing against me and smiling. My grandfather, my sister, and actually my dancing family. 
But at the same time, like, I knew what the balloon was about to pop, so I was giggling. Um, final note about that, uh, about the Emotion Arcade, I think it's, it's one of those projects where we combine sign, where scientists were working together with artists, and one thing that we see a lot when that happens is that it's very different cultures, and usually the projects fail when they try to find each other, um, when, th when they both try to achieve their goals completely. Um, usually it works better when one or the other has the lead. So for instance, with the Emotion Arcade, there was a lot of, uh, we, like we had scientists who weren't part of the project who were like, how can you, like an EEG scanner cannot pick up the difference between specific emotions. And then that was true. Actually, there was no difference between the emotion lust or the emotion rage. Like for us, we knew that the, the, it was picking up a r the same vague type of signals that could be linked to arousal levels. Um, but that was not the point, because the point of the artwork was making, uh, inviting people to feel a specific emotion as hard as they could. And I think, um, as a result, the people who participated in this installation had a lot of fun. And I think the biggest mistake that we made was not interviewing the people uh, as they went through the experience, because it's really funny to see I don't know, two couples trying to compete in a lust competition and like what if one half of the couple is really good and the other one isn't? Like then the question and the discussion starts afterwards. Like what were you thinking about? Why, were, why wasn't your balloon going? Or why did it just start and then plateaued there and never really popped? Like those types of questions were really funny and people were even breaking up in some uh, instances. Um, and the point of that is we can use these technologies to make people have real experiences. The data is not necessarily interesting on a scientific level, yet for scientists it's incredibly interesting to see how people interact with these devices. Um, so there's lo a lot of like accidental learnings there. One of the main learnings, I guess, in the end, number five, is don't do everything at once. Um, as awesome as it is to combine VR with AI, with haptic suits, with smell, conveyor belts, and wind machines, don't forget that true immersion, if we're after that true immersion feeling, the feeling of presence, it's not about creating a perfect illusion of reality or a perfect replication of reality. Every new medium tries to sell itself as the best replication of reality so far. Um, from photography, beating painting by a mile and representing reality, and then moving pictures, so much better than photography. But in the end, our, that's not the point of a medium. Uh, reality, a medium cannot compete with reality. Uh, we can go into holodeck discussions and singularity, but my personal view is that reality is always something different than a mediated res uh, representation of it. And our brains, as easily as they can be fooled, they're always perfectly capable of being fooled emotionally and yet completely being aware that, they're sus that we're suspending our disbelief. Um, and in that sense, well-orchestrated forms of sensory deprivation, instead of catering to every sense possible at once, uh, can actually be a much better way to create an immersive experience. Uh, and to illustrate that, um, Anagram, uh, which is uh, um, a performance art duo from the UK, uh, we commissioned them at South by Southwest to do a live performance um, about VR. Um, and what they did was they decided to not use any VR headsets. They actually decided to create the most ex immersive experience that they could come up with. And all they needed was, uh, they put little boxes under every seat. And in those boxes, there was just a blindfold and a piece of fruit. And people put on the blindfold and then were made through an audio story, were made aware of where they were in the space, uh, and then invited to eat the piece of fruit in their box. Some people had an orange, some people had an apple. Um, and it was like one of those weird, weirdly successful performance pieces that, we done, that we've done, where all we needed was a blindfold. Um, and maybe another example in that sense is Drawing Room, which creates one of the uh, um, 
we won our, the, the award at our event last year. It's Traveling the World right now, uh, made by Jan Rothuizen and Sarah Kolster, a Dutch drawing artist and a Dutch interaction designer, uh, just using pen and ink, basically. Um, and it's also a good example of if you're telling a story in VR, don't do everything at once and take it slow. Like all of a lot of the rules that, that, that we've seen so far uh, were applied very well in this project. And I'll show you a short clip of it where they explain the process. My name is Jan Rothuis, I'm a visual artist and I mainly work with pen and ink and what I do is that I make uh, drawings of places and spaces that I visit. For a long time I was fascinated about what it would be like to be actually inside one of my drawings, to be inside of a world that, that only exists of lines and text. I contacted Sarah Kolster we did a lot of interactive design and together with her we came up with a sort of like a concept, a plan. The real challenge was to, to find uh, translations and to adapt Jan's drawings into a in time-based, interactive 360 experience, which was quite difficult. And at the same time we wanted to find a balance between telling uh, a linear story and on the other hand um, giving the user a freedom of choice to navigate through the story. If you turn your head to the left, you see the dumb square. Today, it's mainly a meeting place for people who don't have any specific goal. I got in touch with the developers team of Desbans and together we decided to uh, make the experience for Occam's Rift. The big difficulty in making sure that you can actually be there in that 3D environment is that his drawings are so clear and how do we get that same line into 3D with you being able to look around and watch all around you. So I think the power of this project is to keep it simple and make it as real as possible um, and not turn the experience into a roller coaster. So I think that's it's, it's one of the main uh, challenges of interactive virtual reality nonfiction experiences is how do we go beyond the roller coaster? Um, how do we do more than just have like these literal roller coaster experiences in VR? Um, and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I hope you guys uh, um, at some point may be part of a project and let me know. Uh, that said, I do have the disclaimer that there's nothing wrong with roller coasters. Um, document documentary uh, uh, art has this great reputation of being incredibly boring uh, and educational, and I hope uh, that uh, you got a feeling that it doesn't have to be. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects ever, Birdly. Um, do try it if you get a chance. I would pay 100 bucks to do this right now. Um, and it really it gives you the feeling of flying. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a great example of like all the rules that I just mentioned. This project breaks them all, and it's one of my favorites. Um, so I want to leave you with a question. Uh, it's a question, um, what does VR suck at? As I said, um, right now we're obsessed with what VR can be and can become. Uh, it's still completely in development, so it's really difficult to say VR has to be interactive or not. Uh, a lot of discussion is now around like, how oh, VR is such a isolating personal experience. It's like we went from like reading the newspaper to books to cell phones and now it's just like we're completely uh, detaching ourselves from reality. Um, yet at the same time, there is web VR is being developed, multi-user VR is being developed and is going like at lightning speed right now. Um, walk around VR is happening with the Vive. So the question, it's, it's very hard to, to answer the question, what is VR best at? Um, so that's why sometimes we try to turn it around and, and, and see like, what does VR suck at? Because every medium that we love and that we know 
uh, has at least one thing that it doesn't do well. For instance, books and literature kind of suck at providing us with moving images, leaving it to our brain to convert letters into wonderful images, which makes books uh, such a deeply personal and immersive experience in the end. Films, for instance, uh, opposed to f as opposed to theatrical performance, suck at creating a visceral live experience because it's recorded and we know that it's recorded and it's on a screen there. Uh, and as a result, that enables us to become a perfect voyeur, to be crying and falling in love much more easily with people on the screen without feeling like a pervert or having the fear of catching their eye during their performance or meeting them in the bar later. You can go all the way in like making that emotional uh, connection. Trying to answer the question, what does VR suck at? What is it not capable of doing? Uh, it's impossible for me to say that at this stage, but I do think uh, that the question uh, can help us just as much uh, um, to find out the language of VR uh, by asking the question what it can do uh, is, is just as helpful as asking the question what it can do. So I want to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite new media artists, Jonathan Harris, who made uh, uh, We Feel Fine. Uh, which he made about interactive documentary or interactive storytelling, uh, saying, we speak a new and powerful language capable of saying things no other language can say. But few have realized this, and even fewer have found what to say. Um, and I think that's completely true for VR as well, uh, even though the whole world seems to be jumping on the VR train trying to get a piece of it. Um, so let me know. Um, I would love to see you all in November at ITPA uh, in Amsterdam. Let us know if you're interested to become part of the Immersive Nonfiction Network, if you're interested in becoming part of the Doc Lab Academy, if you are working on something that you want to submit, let me know, um, uh, especially if it's some inflatable multi-user biometric AI balloon. Uh, so thank you. So is this one on? Yes, thanks. Perhaps next uh, year we can have this little cardboard robot as a moderator because you really open up for questions uh, when he's answering uh, or asking them. Um, you did a little challenge. You said, well, the best question can experience something uh, yep. you have on your uh, laptop. So um, any questions from the audience? Kind of like giving a blank piece of paper, right? Yeah, this, this is the blank piece of paper. Pe yeah, this is, this is scary <laughs> shit. <laughs> Well, um, then I'll start off. Uh, <laughs> I went to this little pop-up VR cinema that sort of yep. toured the Netherlands. You uh, may have um, been there as well. Yep. Uh, which And it's fun, uh, but the experience is still, yeah, it's a bit low quality, etc. But it, it's, it's more immersive and better than 3D. But it's pretty expensive to produce uh, VR. And so I was wondering, 3D, mm -hmm, when will this really be become mainstream? As in that you can go to the movies, and it's not 3D, but it's actually a virtual reality movie. Um, well, it's one of the things that everybody is trying to figure out, like distribution and exhibition of VR. Nobody knows because the medium is still so in flux. So um, we, like with that VR cinema, we actually did our, our uh, VR screening as well, where we had everybody's watching the same pieces in swivel chairs. And I'm very conflicted about it. Um, I think it's something that we really need to do right now and it makes a lot of sense because people haven't seen it, they haven't experienced it, they don't have the devices at home, they're ridiculously expensive uh, and there isn't enough great content so it makes sense to have like these special events and exhibitions where you experience this. Um, however, if you look at it from an experience point of view, it's exactly the same thing as going to a theater sitting in a chair and all reading the same poem at the same time by yourself, <laughs> um, which can be useful. And then you can have a discussion with the poet afterwards. Um, but by the time everybody will have access to a device, I'm not sure if that's the way we will experience it. Um, it's something that a lot of organizations are now thinking like, what type of exhibition space do you need for this? Because we're talking about like walking around experiences you can't do that in a room efficiently and, and effectively uh, with people sitting in chairs. You need like huge spaces. Mm -hmm. So maybe a lot of VR will only be installation pieces that you see at specific events. Um, and I think there was a, someone wrote a great article comparing 
VR. We're comparing the job of the people at Oculus Rift having to market uh, uh, their product, uh, compared it to someone who was working for a, an outdoor pool uh, company, trying to sell outdoor pools to people who had never swam before. <laughs> it's like, you set it up at a space like this and people can try it and jump in and they're like, oh, it's so immersive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and it's like a couple of thousand bucks to like, you, you, like you, you lose half of your garden, <laughs> but then we're going to build it and you can do it whenever you want. It's, it's a hard sell. Um, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's see, it's the interesting answer. Um, who of the audience is actually thinking of, I don't know, working in VR, creating something, perhaps is working on it right now? Yeah, then. There must be a question of you, you know, he's got five tips, but perhaps more. What are you working on? I have a question. Yeah, what exactly. Are what are you working on? Um, I was doing research for, uh, for my school. It's uh, Willem de Koning Academy in uh, Rotterdam. And I'm studying advertising. And I'm, I was researching for the last six months what uh, the virtual world uh, does to our behavior, our social behavior, uh, our relationships with each other. And um, I'm just creating a lot of content right now for uh, like, I'm thinking about the, the same steps that you're taking, I, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but, but what's really hard as, as a, because I have a film uh, uh, background and it's really hard to change the perspective of someone who's used to film with D DSLR uh, art cam cameras. But um, how, how, can you like use those skills in this 360 environment? Well, it's or is it completely different? It I yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's two answers. One is, as a filmmaker, you know how to be on set. You know how to work with technology. You know what, um, a lot like that sort of practical side of film production. There's a lot of stuff that you know that someone from a theater background doesn't know. Yeah. Um, the other thing, the other however, you don't know what it is to deal with a 360 space. True. Like a, a filmmaker traditionally thinks in front of this, the camera and behind the camera. There is no behind the camera. Like one of my favorite things is uh, filmmakers moving into VR and as some of the most brilliant filmmakers that I know, they get on set and they push record, well actually push 10 times record on all the GoPros. <laughs> and that's the moment that they realize, shit, I'm in the frame. Now what do I do? I'm usually mm -hmm. not in the frame. Mm -hmm. How do I direct the person? In a documentary situation, you do that in very subtle things like, like changing your mic or like having an eye, eye contact with your cameraman. Um, that doesn't, isn't possible there. So in some cases, people sit under the tripod and then they realize, wait a minute, if I have eye contact with the person, they keep looking underneath the camera lens, it's weird. Yeah. So it's, theater people are much better at that. Performance artists, installation people, they know how to deal with that. So we get new actors, actually. I wouldn't say get new actors, I would say uh, get collaborators. collaborators. Because maybe you don't have all the skills needed to make a VR piece. Maybe you collaborate with a radio person or yeah. uh, uh, a theater person, a thea like a set designer for theater. They know how to do that, or inter interior architect. They know how to work with that. Hmm. Interesting. And maybe, maybe one more thing in that sense, uh, in terms of the lesson of like what we learned from interactive storytelling, where we had a lot of the same thing, like filmmakers moving into interactive stories, realizing that, or, or that they are not great at telling interactive stories because they're great at telling linear stories. They're also not great at doing, like, for instance, web design or creating an app. Um, and that's not a problem because then they would get like a great web designer or a great interactive producer to collaborate with. The problem was that film people, like how a film is structured, like a film is made like a military operation, right? It's the director, like the producer says no to or yes to the money, but other than that, the director rules everybody. In projects like this, it's much more uh, horizontal and collaborative. And maybe your theater person might have a much better creative idea of what to do in a specific situation than you. And it's like nobody is in charge. And that's something for film people that is always difficult to like figure out.
Okay, anyone else working on a VR or thinking about it? Having a question? Yes. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, a project uh, which involves sending uh, customers Google Cardboards to have a conversation with one of uh, my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I am, uh, cons yeah, I'm concerned about is basically the conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, what yeah, how do you mean, like how to curate or create the conversation? Well, the thing is, someone's wearing a cardboard, and they can't see each other. They can't see each other. Yeah. Uh, you can see my colleague, but the colleague can see the the one who's mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's talking with. Yeah. And that's one of my concerns. And uh, how do you think about uh, resolving uh, th uh, that problem? Because you said, what does VR suck at? Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think VR sucks at conversation. Well, I think one of the, the, the things I felt with like what VR sucks at, what might be the thing is it might suck at creating social experiences. It might actually excel at isolating us from this like constant 25 tabs and, and messages and everything happening at the same time, we're just there in a space. Like that's, it's a meditative experience for a lot of people. That's why they love it so much. Yeah. Um, so that might be one thing. In terms of creating conversations, um, that might be another, even though there's a lot of uh, development being done right now on eye tracking and uh, like the little face swap apps that we're playing with right now. like combining that technology by like creating a, uh, taking a picture of your face right now, then tracking your facial movements so that we can project your face in sort of a rendering of how you would might, might be looking. <laughs> like there's a lot of uh, um, playing being done with that, but I'm not sure. I'm very conflicted in a sense that I think, is, is it worth it? to go all the way and, and like have all those new technologies to capture our face while we're covering it. It's like, maybe the point is that we're covering it. Yeah. Maybe that maybe we should just work with that. It's like inflatable doll syndrome. Like it's like improving an inflatable doll by like filling it with warm water or like <laughs> getting it to like talk and adding an AI chip. At some point you're like, maybe I should just go on a date. Yeah. Like maybe <laughs> that's more, makes more sense. I don't know. Also, uh, if I can sure. do one more sure, thing, sure. Uh, you said about uh, the, the immersive feeling you get from uh, virtual reality, because uh, I, I've t talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people say they are uh, they're not uh, at comfort when they're wearing VR in yep. public places. Uh, is that is it that something? Uh, what 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 do you think about when you're creating the events? Because if I'm in a public event wearing a, a headset. Mm -hmm. I can't see what the hell is going on yeah. around me, and I might feel a little bit discomforted. Uh, yeah. how, how do you think about that? I think it's two things. One, one of the things is exactly like we didn't have that problem with the with the Google Gear, right, or the the Google Glass, um, which we could actually see each other, and that was exactly the reason that Google Glass didn't catch on, <laughs> because it was much more awkward. To have some, if I would be like looking at you and you know, like means means like triggering some app maybe, <laughs> that was really awkward. And you would not know, you wouldn't know whether I'd be recording you, whether I'd be looking at you or not. There's like basic human interaction, like not looking at each other, not knowing whether we have are in contact right now. That's like rule number one of, of human interaction. So I'm not sure if it's something that we need to solve. Maybe it's like maybe that is something that. It, uh, is the trick of VR being successful. Yeah. Interesting, thank you. <laughs> One last question, perhaps? Ah, maybe the question. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Well, my question is, um, 3D took off also a, a bit few years ago. 3D took off, right? You mean uh, 3D television? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that you could never uh, really took off, though. Mm, yeah, well, that's the that's the thing, right? It uh, you had uh, movies, you had games, uh, all 3D. Yeah. Um, well, right now VR is here, and it's going to say bad. It is hyped. Uh, uh, 3D was hyped too back then. Uh, do you think VR will really take off, or do you think VR will stay like 3D was back then? I think we wouldn't have had VR 
if it wasn't for 3D television. Uh, in terms of a lot of the technology that was developed for that, actually made, was one of the building blocks for VR to, to actually happen. Um, I've never, never, ever felt a, a strong experience with a 3D film. Like it always felt like watching a stereoscopic postcard only moving. Um, I actually dislike dislike the whole thing because it's still in a frame. So it, the depth is just, it's very much a gimmicky thing. It doesn't really add anything to it. Um, so I don't feel that 3D television ever took off. It was huge at tech conferences, like specifically television broadcast conferences. That's where 3D television had a place. Um, hardware television companies selling it to each other. I've never seen it at film festivals as something that people were excited about. There was because the content didn't make sense at all for it. With VR, I think we're in a different position. The tech challenge is much bigger. Um, we don't have the television in the living room paradigm that we can build on. It's a completely new thing. It's a completely new medium. So I'm not, that might be reason enough for it to fail um, because it's, it's very fragile at this stage. There is not enough content. However, I've seen at least 20 projects so far that I would want to watch 10 years from now again. That for me are like Man with a Movie Camera in, in early cinema or you name, uh, uh, I don't know, Mist in, in, in gaming. Like those are experiences that make you feel, hey, we're onto something. Whether it's something we see in a museum 10 years from now, maybe, maybe not. Thank you. So, Casper, what was the best question? Ah, they They're were all, all good. Difficult. No, I don't know. I don't know. They were all good. You have to pick uh, one. Well, you can all watch it. Oh. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, just join Casper. Just Kasper. have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> join Casper later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, if you have time, well, uh, show uh, show whoever is interested uh, the the good stuff. Uh, there's a gift for you as well. Uh, you will get it from one of the ladies.